Thank you, Christopher. Let's turn in our Bibles this evening to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, for those who may be streaming, watching the stream at one point or another, we're beginning just a little bit early because no children's Bible time tonight. And uh, that's because the children aren't here. And, uh, but this gives us an opportunity to remember our families in prayer. I know that the, we're praying for the Bond family as they are going through a number of illness. I heard one has a double ear infection and I've heard strep throat. So does that sound accurate? Yep, and so we were checking with grandma and auntie. <laughs> and uh, so we wanna be keeping the Bond family in prayer. I also know that Dylan and Yvonne have been dealing with illness uh, this past week. So uh, it gives us a good reminder to keep uh, these families with children in prayer. There's quite a bit of illness that's going around. And you know, as we as an adult deal with that and we get through it, we forget sometimes how it's so much more difficult for the children as they're exposed to some of these germs for the first time. And so that's, that's something that uh, we wanna keep them in prayer. All right, there's a note sheet tonight. I have two young men, I'm gonna ask them to hand it out. It's a tan note sheet and I'd like to make sure everyone gets a copy of it. Uh, two weeks ago, we began a little bit of a series on the kingdom in the Bible. So you may have a white half sheet and you may need that, we'll see. Uh, but as you get this note sheet, the tan one, on that note sheet you will find everything that we covered last time, two weeks ago, but I've expanded point number B4. B4 on your half sheet does not have the material that you should have just received. Could you leave one of those uh, handfuls with Brother Ed in case some people come in? And uh, then Forrest, if you could put the rest of those right there on the front table up here. I feel like an air traffic controller. <laughs> Thank you, I really appreciate that, guys. That's a big help. Uh, there's, there's so much information on the subject of the kingdom in the Bible. And my experience is there's a lot of confusion on the topic, the important biblical topic of the kingdom. People seem to uh, mix verses together that should be kept distinct, and verses that should be brought together, they seem to keep distinct. There seems to be some uh, uh, confusion on the topic. Our reason for this subject is we're learning about the church, the body of Christ. Particularly, we wanna understand more what the Word of God says directly to New Testament local assemblies. Did you find Colossians chapter one? Look at verse 13. Colossians chapter one and verse 13. I'm gonna begin in verse 12, the prayer, well maybe to get the whole context the, in verse nine. The prayer begins in verse nine. So let's read the whole prayer that Paul prays and uh, it, it goes all the way through. Uh, I'm gonna go at least to verse 18 because Paul is long-winded. Hopefully I'm not. So Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse nine, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins." He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things consist and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Let's pray. 
Father, it's our desire to give the Lord Jesus Christ the preeminence, the first place. You have done that, and I pray that we will acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord to your glory as we honor your Son. Thank you that we find acceptance in the Beloved One, Jesus Christ, when we placed our faith and trust in him. Oh, to know, Father, that we have been born again through faith in Jesus Christ, who died and shed his blood to pay for our sins. Oh, to know, Father, that we have assurance of our salvation because you have sent forth your Spirit into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, leading us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And so now, Father, as we look into your word, may your Spirit give us understanding, especially as we try to understand this complex doctrine of the kingdom and how it relates to the church. Guide us and bless our hearts, fill our hearts with your truth. May it mold and shape us that we would understand what you have said. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 13 of Colossians 1, uh, God wants us to know that when you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, he delivered you from the power of darkness. Aren't you thankful? First uh, John tells us that we are born children of the devil. That's the way we're born into this world. God says that, and uh, he wants us to be a child of God. The only way you can be child of God is to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you're then delivered from the power of darkness, and notice, conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love. We are transferred, if you will. We've been removed out of one realm and placed into another realm, and that realm is in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God's very Son. And so we need to understand this concept of the kingdom. It's very important to understand this concept. We want to understand how it relates to the church, as we see here in this verse, and there's a number of others in New Testament epistles, where there is a direct uh, uh, notification to us as believers that we are now part of the kingdom. So we need to understand the kingdom. Referring to the notes that were handed out, the tan sheet that you have, we have looked at, a couple weeks ago, the definition of the kingdom. The kingdom is a politically organized community, this is just the word in general, uh, or a major territorial unit having a monarch monarchical form of government headed by a king or a queen. That's right from the dictionary. And so there's three basic elements. Charles Ryrie points this out in his doctrine, theology, that there's a king, there are the subjects, and there is a realm. You need three things to have a kingdom. You need to have the king or a ruler, the monarch, whoever the monarch is, and you need to have those who are ruled, and then you need to have the realm, that sphere in which they are ruled. Very often we're familiar with it being a geographical realm, all right? but there's a realm of some sort. We, we noted that the church is the body of Christ. We see that again here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. In addition to the passages that we looked at in Ephesians, the church is the body of Christ. So we need to make a distinction. The church is not the nation of Israel, and the nation of Israel is not the church. They're two distinct groups. We need to keep that in mind. The nation of Israel are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, they are God's chosen people still. He has a plan and a program for these people, his special people, Israel. Very sadly, they've been set aside because they have rejected their king. They rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, thankfully, there are some Jews who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior. What a blessing. Jonathan Sarfati works at the Creation Ministries International. He's a Jewish man but he's a believer in Jesus Christ. What a privilege to know some Jews who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior. But you know, in this age, the word of God teaches us in the New Testament epistles, there's no distinction between Jew or Gentile in the church. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ in this age, you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We're part of the church. The church is a separate, distinct entity, which is a spiritual entity. John 1, 12 and 13 is very clear. The new birth gives us new life. We become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So your standing before God doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're a king or a slave. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you have nothing. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, spiritually you have everything 
you're a child of God. That's a distinction we need to make between Israel and the church, all right? Now, point number three under these distinctions, notice the fourth diamond. The kingdom is the exercise of the sovereign rule of God in a particular realm which he has given to different ones at different times. We're going to see this tonight in the scriptures. God, we saw the first phase, and I list out different phases of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is overall. Psalm 103 and verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. God is the number one sovereign. And by the way, as parents or whoever you are in whatever uh, sphere you're in, authority is very, very important to God. God has given you authority. He wants you to uphold that authority in a God-honoring way, loving those who are under you, but taking authority seriously. And uh, parents are to be obeyed. Authorities are to be obeyed. This honors God when we obey the authorities who are over us. That's very important to the Lord because he's the supreme ruler and the uh, final authority. His kingdom rules over all. God's kingdom rules over all his creation. We saw that here again in verse 16. Notice, uh, God created, Jesus created all things uh, that are on earth and that are in heaven, things that are visible, things that are invisible. And when it says thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, if you study those four words out in the New Testament, that refers to four ranks of angels. That's what Paul's talking about there is angels. That's for you and I, that's an unseen realm. But God's kingdom is over the angels as well, even though one third of the angels are in rebellion against God and have followed Satan. Do you know he's trying to establish his own realm? He wants to be worshipped not only by angels, some of them do. He wants to be worshipped by men. He is the enemy of God. All right, God's kingdom is overall. Now, secondly, B2, we saw that God gave dominion to man when he created man. Back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, uh, God blessed them. This is before sin entered creation. When God saw everything that he created and it was very good, there in that perfection, God said, he blessed Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, and notice it involved the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. Now in chapter 3, with the entrance of sin, things changed. Because Adam was ruling on behalf of God. God's the ruler over all. And in this earth that God created, God gave dominion to Adam. But sin changed that because the fellowship with God was broken because man was now a sinner. That's very important. So that dominion he gave to man over his creation changed. And we really get a vivid picture of that when in Genesis chapter 9, first of all, in Genesis chapter 6, the earth was evil always continually. And God sent a flood to destroy the earth, Genesis 7 and 8. When they came down off the ark, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives, God renewed the blessings that he said to them, be fruitful, multiply. But God gave man a responsibility, and that's human government. Specifically, God told man to act on his behalf to exercise his authority in putting murderers to death. That was the responsibility, Genesis chapter 9. But God also put the fear of man into the animal kingdom now. Things changed after the flood tremendously, and it's all because of sin and the judgment of God, the punishment upon sin. These are things to keep in mind. Let number three, be number three. We saw that God created the nation of Israel as a kingdom. In Exodus chapter 19, God told the nation of Israel, you are a kingdom of, you ready? Priests. We don't think in terms of that. When we, think of king, when we think of a kingdom, we think of kings, we think of knights, we think of swords, we think of armies, we think of power. God created the nation of Israel as a kingdom of priests to be a mediator between him and all the nations. Remember now, everything changed when they came down off the ark. Mankind is in outright rebellion against God. Genesis 11 makes that clear, doesn't it? We will not have this God to rule over us. Those words are echoed, echoed in Psalm 2. They built a tower to reach unto heaven to make a name for themselves. 
That's rebellion against God. God created us to bring glory to him. They wanted to make a name for themselves. All right, so God raised up the nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. But we see that not long after they were in the promised land, that they were tired of the judges, particularly they not, did not want Samuel's sons, Eli's sons. Remember Eli the high priest, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas? It was a sin mess is what was taking place. All kinds of sin everywhere, and the people demanded that Israel, Israel demanded that Samuel give them a king. Why? Because they wanted to be like other nations. Now, provision had been made for a king in the future at some point. There was instructions given in the book of Deuteronomy. Even, even when Moses uh, gave instructions, there was rules about a king, what he could do and what he shouldn't do, writing the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures out. But Israel didn't want a king because they were looking for God's man to rule over him. They wanted to be like the other nations. And so God gave them what they wanted. God gave them a manly man, Saul, a man who evidenced that he was full of pride. And uh, in his kingdom, we saw last, uh, last time, was taken away from him. And God did give to the people of Israel a king who was a man after his own heart, David. He wasn't a perfect man. No one is. No man is perfect. No man, woman, child is perfect. There's only been one, Jesus Christ, God who became flesh. But I get ahead of myself. Samuel, I'm sorry, sorry, David was not a perfect man, but he was a man who loved God. He was a man who was repentant over his sins, and he was a man of God's choosing. And God made promises to David in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 17. God chose David's seed and said that he would establish, God would establish his kingdom in David's seed, and it would be forever. God made promises to David about a kingdom and that has to do with the nation of Israel. Now tonight, we want to pick it up under Gentile kingdoms. Would you turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 2? Gen Daniel, chapter 2. This is number 4 in your notes now, the kingdom. And I wrote under Gentile kingdoms because something happens. The sons of David uh, are about as faithful as any mankind has ever been all through time. As you read the book of First and Second Kings, as you read the book of First and Second Chronicles, it tends to get a little bit ugly. Just like the book of Judges tends to get a little bit ugly. Uh, I think you might agree with me that Jeremiah, his statement in Jeremiah 17:9, when he assesses the heart of man, is on display throughout the history of all mankind. We're looking at Israel at the moment. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we watch the kings after Solomon, because Solomon, because of all these wives he multiplied, Moses said, don't do that. His heart was turned away from God and he built temples for his pagan wives for their idols. Wickedness. God split the nation in half. Israel, ten tribes to the north. Judah, two tribes to the south. Never, ever would there be a good king in the ten tribes to the north, not even one. Not even one. And to the south, just a couple, just a couple of kings, a few, Hezekiah, Jehoshaphat, a few um, who are good kings. Those aren't the only ones. And, and the history of the kings was to go after the idol, idols of the Gentiles. God brought the nation of Israel into existence to reveal to the world the one true God. His name is Jehovah. He's the creator of heaven and earth. There is no other God. And yet we read about kings who uh, want to go after the Lord, but they're not loyal to him. Just one example, conquer the Edomites. We'll conquer the Edomites. God gave him victory over the Edomites. And so what does he do? He takes the Edomite idols and he worships them. These are now my gods. This is the history again and again and again. So what happens? God brings his judgment upon Israel to the north and then later on upon Judah to the south. They go into captivity. As we come to Daniel chapter 2, even now Judah has gone into captivity. All right, And as Daniel has been taken from Jerusalem into captivity, God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar his plan that he has 
and that he's working out because God is going to establish his kingdom. Adam failed. Israel failed, right? God's continuing to go forward with his program. He's going to bring his man to the throne. He's going to do that because that's his purpose all the way back to the book of Genesis. God gives to Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Later on in the book, Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, God's going to give dreams to Daniel. But here he gives the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And you know it, Nebuchadnezzar sees a great statue. By the way, either Nebuchadnezzar forgets or he chooses not to tell all the wise men the dream. You have to tell me the dream or you're all done for. No one has ever asked anyone to do this before. (laughs) But that was Nebuchadnezzar's demand. There are a number of Bible students who believe that Nebuchadnezzar didn't even remember the dream. I don't know if he did or didn't, but he wouldn't tell. Daniel had a prayer meeting. His prayer meeting important. He got to know, together with Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, and they prayed, and God revealed to Daniel the dream and the interpretation. I want you to look at verse 37. We are concerned with the interpretation. In verse 37 of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel says, after telling the dream, verse 36, this is the dream. He already told him what it was. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Who gave this kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar? God did. Now, this is important for us. To, this is something people skip over. There are a lot of people who take power for themselves and establish their own kingdom. We live in a fallen, sinful world. But this kingdom was given to Nebuchadnezzar by God. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. I want you to notice that. As a matter of fact, we are now going to hear about four kingdoms. God is going to reveal that there are four Gentile kingdoms. Why is God specifically giving a kingdom to these men? Well, there's many reasons. I don't know all of them. I can tell you some of what I learned from the scripture. But one thing is very important to keep in mind. Israel is no longer a kingdom. They've been conquered. They've been expelled from the land. You go back to 2 Chronicles, the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. The temple has been burned and destroyed. The huge bronze columns that Solomon built, they broke them in pieces and took them to Babylon. The sea, the laver, took it to Babylon. It's all been taken. It's all gone. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And God reveals there are going to be four Gentile kingdoms that he gives to Gentile kings. Now, there have been others who've tried to take the kingdom on their own and have the kind of kingdom you read about here that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. Adolf Hitler comes to mind. Joseph Stalin comes to mind. There's been plenty more. Not a one of them has ever succeeded. Not a one of them. Because God hasn't given the kingdom to them to rule. But God gave it to these four. Number one is Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the first. And he is the head of gold on the statue, the first kingdom. Now, following after that will be the Persian Empire. Verse 39, but you shall arise, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. And in chapter 8, in verse 20, it is identified by name. The next kingdom is going to be Media Persia. The two of those nations together conquer Babylon, but it turns into the Persian Empire, and it's named in chapter 8, the Persian Empire. Verse 39, there's a third kingdom. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, now notice, which shall rule over all the earth, over all the inhabited earth of that time. The focus, please keep in mind, is Israel, the promised land. Where did Daniel pray towards every day, three times a day? Jerusalem. That's, where, that's the whole biblical focus. That's hard for us here in America. America is the center of everything, right? No, not in God's pro- program. Israel is the center. And God gave yet a third kingdom to this 
kind of dominion over the promised land. It was going to be there. They're named in Daniel chapter 8 as well, verse 21. This is the Greek Empire, the Greek Empire. Now, this is all history for us. It's easy for us. In Daniel's day, Daniel got a headache. This was hard because it was all future for him. But for you and I, this is now, as we look at what's given as prophecy, we're just going down the history. We can see it. We, we saw it. It all happened. We only saw it by reading it in the books. All right, then there's going to be a fourth kingdom, verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. The fourth kingdom, of course, is the Roman Empire, which followed the Greek Empire. It is not named by name in the book of Daniel, but it is spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. There's going to be 69 weeks that is going to lead up to Messiah being cut off. Daniel chapter 9. And the one who is the prince of the people when Messiah is cut off, will destroy the city. Well, once again, while this was a headache for Daniel, this one's not even named. This is just history for you and me. Messiah came as prophesied in the Old Testament, and the Lord Jesus Christ, keep your finger here and turn with me to Luke chapter 2. The Word of God details this. Luke chapter 2, in verses 1 through 7, this fourth empire is none other than the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was, in fact, in power when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Luke is very careful to note this for us. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that, there went, that a decree went out from whom? Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. And this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Please notice in verse 7, speaking of Mary. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Beautiful passage that touches our hearts. I'm in August. I missed by one month. Some people like to have Christmas in July. It's a blessing to read about the incarnation. God became flesh. But what did this happen? In fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. The fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. Now come back to Daniel. I wanted you to keep your finger there because this fourth empire, it's revealed to us, is in two parts. We see in verse 41, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet strength, the strength of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. There's going to be a revival of the Roman Empire, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Now that follows on the heels of Daniel 9, 26. <laughs> In Daniel 9, 24 through 26, we have the fourth empire, the Roman Empire. Then we have the 70th week of Daniel. Hmm. And there's a gap in between. After the Messiah is cut off and then the establishing of a covenant that allows the sacrifices to resume. You know, you and I today are living in a time when Israel cannot bring their sacrifices like Moses brought his sacrifices, like Isaiah. Name all these Old Testament, just like they did. Even in Jesus' day, they could go to the temple and bring their sacrifices because the temple was rebuilt after the captivity. But not today. There's no temple. There's no brazen altar, just like Daniel 9 says. But there's going to be a covenant that's going to made, be made that's going to allow Israel to resume bringing their sacrifices. Daniel 9, 27. Now that's yet future. That has not yet happened. And there's going to be a revival of the Roman Empire. Now there's a lot of information in Daniel's chapters 8 and, and again in Daniel chapter 9 and 10 about this revival, especially this number 10. Here in chapter 2, 10 toes. We're going to hear about horns in chapter 8. We're not going to look at all this tonight. Uh, but you can study it out, and some able scholars have put it together. This 
revival of the Roman Empire is going to be none other than the empire of the Antichrist of which you read in Revelation chapter 13. This is going to be a revival, and, and it's spoken of here. Now, the dream goes on, because after Nebuchadnezzar saw this statue, head of gold, chest of silver, midriff of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron mixed with clay, then there was a stone made without hands that hits the statue in the feet. During the time of the revival of the Roman Empire, a stone hits the feet, destroys the whole statue, pulverizes it, and then the stone grows into a mountain that's going to fill the whole earth. That's in verse 35 of this chapter in the vision. In verse 44, we have the explanation. In the days of these kings, that's the ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a what? A kingdom. He's going to set up a kingdom. Here's four kingdoms with a revival of the fourth that God has given, specifically given, but God is going to set up his kingdom in the days of the ten kings, the revived Roman Empire. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, that is the kingdoms of men, and it shall stand forever." So the God of heaven is going to set up his own kingdom. It's going to break in pieces all these other kingdoms that God has given to men, and God's kingdom is going to stand forever. Now just before we move on, God had something very important he needed to teach Nebuchadnezzar. Turn to chapter 4. Speaking about these four kingdoms, God has never, ever, ever abdicated his throne. God has never, ever, ever relinquished his authority. Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn this. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, this time, of a tree. Not a statue, but a tree. A tree that's great. So great, it houses in its branches all the birds. Everything comes to find its provision through this tree. Hmm. Where did this tree come from? How did this tree get there? The answer is God grew the tree. Daniel 2.37, God gave this kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar, like other men, doesn't see it that way. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. He's given the interpretation of it. This tree is cut down. And Daniel has the sorry responsibility of telling Nebuchadnezzar, the tree is you. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar to repent and break off his sins. And in just 12 months' time, in one year, Nebuchadnezzar loses sight of all of this, and he's walking through Babylon, and he says these words, Is not this Babylon which I have built for my glory? That's how mankind is. We take all the credit and all the glory to ourselves. Now, you can read this whole chapter. It's a dynamic chapter. But we're told in the dream what God needed to teach Nebuchadnezzar that all men need to learn. What did the watchers say? Notice verse 25. This is still talking about the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar, they will drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make, make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with do, the dew of heaven seven times, that's seven years probably, shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Earlier, Daniel said in chapter 2, God's the one who raises kings up and he's the one who removes kings. God has never abdicated his sovereign rule. All men who are in positions of authority, no matter who they are, are supposed to recognize God and honor him in the way they rule. Unsaved men don't do that. Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it. The Persians didn't do it. The Greeks didn't do it. The Romans didn't do it. And where are each of those kingdoms? They're gone. Every single one, gone. Because they don't acknowledge the God who gave that authority to them. Sinful, like all mankind. Sinners, sinners, sinners. Uh, inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you have come to know that heaven rules. 
Who's ruling in the affairs of men? God is from heaven. This is important to understand and to see. All right, all of this happens. Verse 28, came to pass, King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months, a year later, was walking in his palace. And as I said to you in verse 30, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for my honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. That is, the kingdom's not going away that God gave, but the king is being deposed, and he's being deposed by means of insanity. Insanity that was imposed upon Nebuchadnezzar until what? Well, first of all, for the purpose. Verse 32, notice in verse 32, right midway through the verse, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Do you think it's important to God that we understand that he is sovereign over all? <laughs> Who's really in charge? God is. God is in charge. It doesn't look like that to us. If you were to be in Babylon in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, you would look at their gods, Marduk, and all their temples and all their wealth. You'd look over there at Jerusalem and you'd say, God's in charge? I don't believe it. God's in charge. He has not abdicated his throne. He's working out his plan. He's working out his will. And he's in charge. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar found out. Verse 34, at the end of the time, the seven times passed over him. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. I want to tell you that's grace. That's grace that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. And at the moment he had it available to him, he knew what to do. He did the right thing. When God was kind to him, he said, I looked up and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Why? His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? I think this Gentile king has some, a wonderful lesson to help us with, don't you? He learned a hard lesson, but he learned it well, learned it well. God rules. We have to get that. You have to, if you're going to understand the kingdom now, in all its different phases, you need to latch on to this. Who's really in control over all? God is. And he does give kingdoms to different ones in different realms at a certain time to exercise his authority. All authority is the exercising of God's authority. The sooner you learn it, the better we'll be. It's a wonderful truth to understand in God's word. I wish our leaders would give me the opportunity to share this with them. I don't know if they'd listen, but it would help. It would help. Notice now, please, the last uh, dot on the bottom of the page. Once we understand that God uh, gave this great green dream to Nebuchadnezzar to teach him that God is truly ruling over all, I want you now to know that Jesus the Son of God came to earth under the fourth kingdom. We already peaked at Luke chapter 2, didn't we? He was born while Caesar Augustus was on the throne. So the fourth kingdom, remember we had four kingdoms. There's a revival of the fourth kingdom that's coming. The toes, the iron mixed with clay and the feet and toes. But during the fourth kingdom, when Rome was the empire, Jesus Christ was born. This is vividly borne out in John chapter 18, all right? John chapter 18, let's go to the Gospel of John. I have two more minutes, so I'm going to finish this last point on the bottom of the page and just introduce phase five. And uh, we will pick it up with that the next time we're together on this subject in two weeks because it starts to get interesting. It starts to get very, very interesting. Notice in John chapter 18. When we come to the Gospel of John chapter 18, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Word, the Creator of heaven and earth, has been arrested. <laughs> and he's standing on trial before a governor, not even the emperor, a governor in Palestine, Pilate. 
Pilate has a lot of questions for Jesus. He answers some of them. He answers some of those questions. And then Pilate, of course, heard that Jesus was a king. He wanted to know all about that. Then he heard that Jesus was the son of God. He wanted to know all about that. <laughs> very, very interesting, isn't it? John chapter 18 and verse 37, Jesus asked, uh, Pilate asked Jesus a question. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, wouldn't you expect a king to say, I was born into this world to wield the scepter of power? I want to tell you, Jesus is going to do that. But Jesus is very clear. I came here to bear witness to the truth. Hmm. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that one the hard way. But here's God. And Luke has a genealogy for us, chapter 3. Matthew has a genealogy for us, chapter 1. Jesus is in the royal line going back to David all the way back to the tribe of Judah. He has a right to the throne. But not only is he of human descent through Mary, an heir to the throne, this is God who became flesh, the creator of heaven and earth, the Messiah, the king. And what does the nation of Israel do? Well, you know it. You know the context here. In this setting, it won't be long before Pilate brings Jesus forth and says, uh, I, I bring forth to you the king of Israel. Here he is. Here, behold your king. To which they will shout, we have no king but the fourth empire, Roman. Isn't that interesting? Israel, created to be a kingdom of priests, said, we choose not a Jewish king. Why? Because the Jewish king came saying, you cannot have the kingdom until your heart is right with God. Do you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we're going to have to pick it up here. We're going to pick it up with this. We're going to see what Jesus and John the Baptist preached, and then what Jesus taught about the kingdom. And this is going to help us. We can't talk about the church yet, because as far as people are concerned, there is no church yet. We don't even know what the church is. We never, up to this point, we haven't even heard about the church in the Bible. We don't even know what the church is yet. We have to wait until the Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell us something about the kingdom, and then he's going to say something about the church. All right, so we'll pick it up here in two weeks. Let's look to God in prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the word of God, for its instruction, and particularly tonight, I want to thank you for the lesson of how we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And as we are humbling ourselves under your mighty hand, casting all our care upon you, truly, O oh Lord, you will exalt us in due time. The mighty hand of God will lift us up. We see the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn, that all those who exalt themselves in pride, you will put down. And so we acknowledge that you are Lord and you are God. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, who stood before Pilate, witnessed the good confession, and then he went to the cross. Jesus died and shed his blood to pay for our sins so that there would be a way for us to come to you in righteousness. Father, we bless you, we honor you, and ask that your spirit will help us to continue to learn and understand these truths. I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name, amen.